Namaste, everyone. Michelle Granberg here. Welcome to another episode of Positive Energy, promoting a world of empathy and compassion for every animal and human. On part one of this show, we're spotlighting New Jersey wildlife and their habitats. Cedar Run Wildlife Refuge is a nonprofit dedicated to the preservation of New Jersey wildlife and their habitats through education, conservation, and rehabilitation. Stay with us to meet a few animal friends and learn how to become an ally for wildlife. Positive Energy starts right now. So I'm really excited to welcome uh, Tracy and Jim from Cedar Run Wildlife Refuge. Welcome to Positive Energy, you guys. Thank you Thanks so for much having for having us. <laughs> so Tracy, you're the Director of Development and Communications. What do you do over there? Correct, so I'm in charge of all the fundraising, the grants, um, all of the communications for social media and just spreading the word about our organization as well as being able to fund all of the amazing work that we do here at Woodford Cedar Run Wildlife Refuge. Love that. And Jim, you're the after school uh, coordinator and educator. What do you do? Yes, yeah, so we just recently, just this past year, started our after school program. So we go out into certain schools that are around our area and have them for an hour, hour and a half or so after the regular school day get them bring some animals, like our friend here we'll talk about in a moment, some other ones, get them kind of a kind of first-hand experience, a lot of nature that should be right around their area that maybe they haven't experienced before, something that they wouldn't necessarily get in their normal school day, get them a little bit, a little something extra, a little taste of Cedar Run, bring it out to them. Oh my gosh, so much fun. <laughs> Great. And so, uh, Tracy, what's the mission of your organization and how long you've been around yeah. and what services do you offer? So um, Woodford Cedar Run Wildlife Refuge is in Medford. We are a three-part mission, so we focus on environmental education, habitat rehabilitation, and um, or habitat preservation and wildlife rehabilitation. So we do have a nature center that is open seven days a week um, that, that the public can come and visit. Um, we have reptiles, we have walking trails, we have um, wildlife enclosures, so where you can actually meet one of our wildlife enclosure um, or wildlife animals, um, Phoebe, um, as well as we have um, all sorts of different New Jersey native wildlife, um, bald eagles, um, we have a white-tailed deer, and these are all non-releasable wildlife. Right. Um, so we have a wildlife hospital on our premises that we take in over 6,300 animals every single year to rehab to release them back into the wild. So we're a community resource that you can call um, if you have any questions about our native wildlife um, and cohabitate with them, as well as if you do find a wildlife animal like um, a skunk or an owl or a snake or a turtle um, and beyond what to do with them if they were injured um, or truly orphaned. Um, so we're a community resource for that. We've wow. been um, around since 1951. Um, and you know, uh, we, are, we have 171 acres that have been preserved by the Green Acres Grant um, in 1997. So we're, um, we also have education programs. So we go to schools, they can come to us for field trips. Um, and Jim is our after school coordinator, like you said. Um, so, you know, kids can learn about nature and why it's so important to protect and preserve our, nat our native wildlife and habitats. I love it. So, Phoebe is with us, very lively. She's snacking. Oops. So, tell us a little bit. So, Jim, tell us a little bit about Phoebe. What would you like our audience to know? What's her story, also? Yeah, so this is our little Phoebe Mufe. She has an eastern striped skunk, as you can see on her big stripe there running down her back. Each skunk you see is gonna have a slightly different pattern. Some are gonna be more dark, some are gonna be more light, uh, but they all have that as a warning sign. They, unlike most animals, which have more of a camouflage of trying to hide, these ones have this bright stripe, so animals at night will see that and go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't go near this animal, hmm. because usually they do it once and they learn quickly, don't go near that animal again. Yeah. They very famously have their spray that they can spray, sometimes up to about 20 feet or so. And besides smelling really bad, but also, if it gets in your eyes, can temporarily blind some of the predators that might go after her. This gives her enough time to kind of scoot away. Um, Phoebe, the reason we have her is, unfortunately, Phoebe was actually um, tried to be kept as someone's pet. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, in certain areas, you can have certain permits 
Um, you can't just go out into the wild and just grab a skunk to have as a it's pet. It's not legal, right? Very illegal. Very. Especially in New Jersey, is very strict on their wildlife laws on that. Good. Um, with Phoebe, someone had her as a pet. They had a, they call it a domesticated skunk, but they're not really domesticated. Right. Um, but they basically do a surgery to remove the scent gland so she can't spray mm -hmm. anymore. However, she does not know she can't spray. Ah. So when she was only a few months old and the family decided, oh, this does not make a good pet because skunks are nocturnal. So they're going to be awake right. all night while you're trying to sleep. You can kind of see she has some big claws on here. She's trying to dig into my hand here. That's why I have the gloves on. Mm -hmm. Have a little bit of food tucked in here. Kind of keep her attention while she's moving around and wiggling here. But if you have something underneath your floor or your carpet, that's not going to hold up well against these claws. No. Your furniture, your walls. She was also chasing the family's dogs all night, and she has sharp little teeth. So they decided this is not an animal I should have in my house. But there's because a reason for that, yeah. There's absolutely a reason. And since she was descented, so she can't spray, can't defend herself, right. and raised by people, she can't be put out in the wild. So luckily, she got brought over to us, and she's been living with us. I think she came in about 2018 or so. How old is she, do you think? So she's about four years old. Okay, so she's right a permanent Almost resident. five, since we're almost 2023 now. Yeah, so since she can't defend herself, she's gonna be with us for the rest of her life. Um, she has a nice little area there. She was trained to be one of our education animals, to be able to come out on programs like this. Um, she comes out to the schools, comes out to programs, lets people see them up a little bit closer, because normally you don't want to get this close to a skunk. That they're very capable of telling you to back up a little bit. So. so she's used to being handled to some degree, but we want to remind people she's a wild animal meant to be in the wild, mm -hmm. even though she's not able to be. We want to really remember that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I've, I've known her for about three years now, and even I still have to wear these big gloves. She's got those claws. She has those teeth. She may not you know, necessarily be angry per se, but she is still a wild animal. Yeah. Instincts happen, and she can nip a little bit, scratch something. Um, as a skunk, they are a potential carrier of rabies. So anyone who handles any of our um, rabies vector species that we call them, they have to have some vaccinations against rabies um, just to make sure both animals and us can stay protected against them. So what should people do if they come across a skunk, um, both just a healthy skunk, just sort of in their mm -hmm. neighborhood, in their yard, and what if there's an injured skunk? What, what do you want to let people know? So the best way to, to handle any wildlife is really to leave them alone and um, to call a licensed wildlife rehabilitation um, center. So um, Cedar Run is one of those, um, but you know, depending on, on the area, um, we always suggest call Cedar Run first and we'll give you the best advice. Is it um, something that should be um, handled to bring into a wildlife rehabilitation center um, as if they are hurt or injured? Um, or if that is perfectly fine, normal behavior, um, and to leave, leave them alone. So we are a community resource. Um, for any questions when it comes to wildlife. Um, but call, do not handle, call a wildlife rehabilitator. Do you find yourself telling people a lot? Just Yes, he, yes, so. You called us, but here's our expert <laughs> advice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just leave the animal alone. Correct, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, especially with, um, with COVID and a lot more people were um, at home, uh, they were seeing a lot more wildlife than they ever have seen because they were home and they were looking out the windows, they were noticing things. <laughs> they were noticing things. more. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you know, is it, is it uh, normal for a fawn to be kind of tucked away um, by a tree? Yes, leave that fawn alone. Mom tucks them away, um, comes back two times um, a day at, at dawn and dusk. Um, but yes, that's perfectly normal. So um, we're happy to answer those calls. We actually got, um, we get four, over 14,000 phone calls from this year alone, from January up until. Um, wow, 14,000 14, in the 14, past 14, year. 14,000 for just the Wildlife Hospital. So. Um, and how know, many of those do you wind up actually having them come in? Good question. Just a small amount or a large amount? Um, it could be a number of, of different factors. Um, it could be the fact that somebody is, is saying, oh my gosh, there is um, a wildlife in need of help, I'm coming to you, or we field those questions. Um, so a good number of those we actually do feel like um, we have given the best advice, especially from our experts. Uh, we do have three wildlife rehabilitation um, team members, mm. uh, wildlife rehabilitators that um, are state and federally licensed. So we are the experts in the field, so yeah. don't hesitate to call us um, if you do have any questions. Um, yeah. And you know, and what to do with that wildlife that may be hurt 
um, or needing some attention and so care. So you're a great resource for that. And we're going to put yeah. your, your website, you know, Perfect. here on the screen for people so they can reach out to you. But Jim, you know, we've learned a little bit already about Phoebe as a beautiful skunk she is. Is there like maybe one really interesting fact you'd like to share or maybe what and maybe one misconception that people have? Absolutely. So I'd go start with the biggest misconception is a lot of people, they'll see a skunk and get really scared and think it's going to chase them and spray them. And not the case. They don't want to spray you. That spray is the last line of defense. They are going to, one, just try to run away. That's just the easiest option for them. If they can't run away, they feel trapped or you're coming up a little bit too close for it, they will warn you. They'll make some little noises, maybe make some little grunting sounds. They will also stomp their feet. It's kind of cute, but it's a warning. Back up. You are way too close. Right. This is your last warning because after that, they turn around, they lift up that tail. And like I said, they can spray about 20 feet or so. And very often, they actually aim towards the face, towards the eyes because they will, that will definitely convince you to go away. So if they spray you, they have enough spray for maybe one or two sprays, and then they have to wait about 10 days to build that up. Wow, that's fascinating. So after they spray like one or two times, they're going to be defenseless for a little bit over a week. Wow. So they don't want to spray you. Right. They're going to try to hold that until they really right. consider like themselves. Right, like money. They're holding on yep, to it like gold. That last minute, like, this is all I got left. This is all I get. Give it a shot. <laughs> so if you get sprayed by a skunk, you are a little bit too close for it. And that's kind of on you, not them. They're, they're trying to get away. Can they smell their own spray? I mean, because you said they have a great sense of smell. So, does it does, obviously doesn't bother them. Yeah, so you can definitely see her little <laughs> nose kind of sniffing in there. I um, ask questions like a kindergartner would ask, I think. <laughs> totally yeah, good. No I'm just a kindergartner at heart. That's all good. So with little Phoebe here, you will see her little nose going in the air. With them being nocturnal out there at the night, their eyesight is not the best. They can still see, definitely. But they're, you can see her little nose going right there a little bit, sniffing around. They really rely on their nose. So they have a great sense of smell, but yeah, their smell to them doesn't really bother them too much. It's kind pretty of just neutral. pretty just average, kind of like their own natural body odor. <laughs> I can say. Even though she is descended, That's a she good. does have a little odor to her um, naturally. Uh, but yeah, she just can't spray it or anything. Um, I would say my favorite aspect of them yes. uh, with these skunks is skunks and some of their close related relatives are actually pretty much immune to venomous snake bites. No kidding. So they can actually get bit by, let's say, like a rattlesnake that we have here in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And she may not feel great for a couple hours, but it usually doesn't kill them or anything. They're able to kind of shake it off. And so they're one of the predators of some of those venomous snakes. Wow. So a couple of different kinds of skunks, weasels, anybody in that kind of mustelid family has some pretty good defenses against things that might potentially hurt other animals. That's the, that's her superpower. Absolutely. So what family do you say she belongs to? The mustelid. How come I haven't heard? That's usually not the common thing. Usually just what think of other like, animals are in that same family? So like if you think of like the ferrets or anything like of that, course, of course. weasel kind of things, anything with that really small low body to the ground. You see her face is very small, kind of pointed because she actually is really good with those big claws. Can actually dig underground really really well, and she also use those claws to dig up ant nests and wasp nests and everything and just go to town. So anything with that kind of small, low kind of body. Very good predator, but she's also an omnivore. She eats a little bit of everything. Ah. Do they like to, see, if, they, if they can, do they like to stay with their family? If, if, or do they tend to be more lone, loners? So as they're growing up, the young ones will kind of stay with mom for a little bit as she kind of teaches them, you know, this is what you got to do. This is where you can find food. This is what you should avoid. Um, find some safe places to go. But then they kind of separate each other out. If there's an area with a lot of food and habitat, you might see some pretty close to each other. Mm. Uh, but usually they're kind of usually pretty much on their own. I can see why. Oh, she got that quick. <laughs> she said, I saw that piece of apple. <laughs> you can see her little chomping teeth there. Oh my goodness. So I guess just to sort of summarize a little bit about skunks, um, anything else you want to share, either of you? So uh, I would say, you know, there a lot of people are scared of them. Um, but they definitely are an important part of our food web, of our um, ecology um, here in New Jersey and pretty much everywhere else. These striped skunks are found all over the place. Uh, but even their relatives, they're all important. Um, just give them their space. They'll give you your space. They want nothing to do with you. Right. Um, we do recommend people, as cute as they are, don't go try to pick them up. Don't try to pet them. You don't need to feed them, I promise you. They're perfectly capable of finding food on their own. And just live in their life. You know, view them from afar. View That's them kind of the from best. A, appreciate yes. them from yes. afar. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or have us come out and see Phoebe. You can see one up close without getting too. Are they about endangered it. at all? Because I don't see many anymore. Or... Um, not here in New Jersey. No, these okay. guys are pretty, pretty okay. good. Um, like I said, just mostly nocturnal, so they're not going to be awake when you're awake. Um, sometimes you see them in the day, but usually they're out when we're asleep, and they've gotten usually pretty good at avoiding humans because they've learned humans tend to not treat them too well, or they're around humans too often, they disappear. So they've learned to stay away, but sometimes people have them kind of 
nest under their porch in the winter because they kind of uh-huh. don't quite hibernate, but <laughs> cool down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you. Well, thank you for bringing her. She's so absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. And you're doing such important work. But we're going to stop uh, and bring in another furry friend or shelled friend. Shelled friend. <laughs> okay, so now Positive Energy is welcoming Tommy. Hi, Tommy. He says hello. <laughs> He's an Eastern box turtle. So, Jim, tell us about Tommy, how he came to you, and a little bit about turtles. Yeah, absolutely. So, many people may see some pictures of these box turtles, or if they're really, really lucky, they may see them kind of crawling across the road, and you can kind of help give them a little hand. Uh, they're very noticeable. They have these bright orange and black kind of shells and the patterns, both on the shell and also down on their skin and their legs and everything. Um, Tommy came to us quite a while ago. Um, he got brought into our wildlife hospital, and as we're checking him out, as we do with every animal that comes to our wildlife hospital, we notice he had some special things that made him a little bit different. On his shell here, he has some spots of his shell that kind of the colors don't come through, the scales don't grow properly, the bone kind of sticks up above where it should be, got some kind of misshape in there, and unlike most box turtles that can completely enclose inside their shell, he can't. He can tuck inside a little bit. Oh. But he can't close it up, which is kind of how box turtles get their hands. That was a birth deformity, or that was an injury. Well, Don't know. most likely, what we have kind of seen is the most likely cause for that is that somebody actually tried to keep him as a pet, mm. and they don't necessarily provide the right food for them, and they don't get the right nutrients. And he developed something called metabolic bone disease, where the shell and the bones don't grow properly. Mm. So now his just shell doesn't quite close where it should. He's got the little bit of extra bit poking up here, um, but they didn't bring him in because of that. Somebody just found him in the wild, and what you can't see, if I turn around, he's actually missing a little bit of the foot back here. So he was most likely attacked mm-hmm. um, either by a dog or a fox or a coyote or something out there. Maybe they realized, oh, I can't take care of this, and you know, it's a turtle, just go release it out into the woods, because fox turtles are found in the woods. But with him being raised by people and not having the right defenses, he had a little bit of a rough time there. But luckily, got brought to us. Lucky boy. Lucky boy. Lucky Before boy. He's going to live too in much ended there. his best life now. Oh, he's he's living the high life. He's he's one of the staff and public favorites there. Yes. So he is. Um, he's actually symbolically adoptable too, um, where anybody can um, adopt either Tommy, Phoebe, or any of our other wildlife, um, and help provide food, medication, and the cost of care along with our other animals in our wildlife hospital. Um, so what you can do is um, you can go to cedarrun.org. You'll get a color photo um, of Tommy or the respective um, wildlife, and um, a little bit about his story and about the species. And there's so many other options um, on our website for for ways to to you support, know, give your and work, support our work, to give, yeah. to keep Tommy yeah. in in food and shelter mm-hmm. yes. at all times. Yeah. So he is one of um, a number of animals that we do have in our wildlife um, that are education animals. So um, they they go to schools, they go to public programming, they go and they um, they visit you know places like this mm-hmm. um, to be able to talk to the public about their species um, and why it's so important not to keep wildlife as pets. Um, because obviously he does not have the proper um, diet to be able to mm-hmm. um, defend himself. And you know, mm-hmm. as a pet, like Jim said, you know, you can't just put them out in the wild. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people do find these animals that either are injured or orphaned. Um, and rather than calling, you know, a wildlife rehabilitation mm-hmm. center or a wildlife rehabber. Um, they don't know what to do with it. So then they keep them and then say, oh gosh, I have a raccoon now, Um, what do I do? Please don't keep it. Please call a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, And we are the experts in that field to be able to make sure that they remain wild. Um, But box turtles are really interesting um, because, you know, they not only, I mean, a lot of people actually say, oh, I don't see them you know, a lot anymore, just crossing the road or something like that. Um, But not as much as, you know, when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's because their habitats are really, um, Mm. are really deplenished because that is the best place. That's, I guess, the the most desirable place to start um, construction. It's up dry land um, of of the Pinelands. So, um, 
we're, we're actually removing a lot of their habitats because of construction. Um, so they're trying to cross the streets to other areas that, um, you know, unfortunately they, they can't survive mm -hmm. um, crossing the road and all of that stuff. So please don't take them home. Um, please don't use them as a pet. Please would please you encourage wild, people to help them across the road though in the same going in the same direction? In the same direction, yes. So, so. so they're doing that for a reason. They, there's some threat behind them that they're escaping from and so we want people to do that. Could be escaping from a threat. Also very often the females are going to find somewhere to lay their eggs mm. and we have just built our roads across where they want to go yeah. and yeah so if the road's going if you're going this way and you see the turtle crossing the road this way Safely for you. Make sure you're able to get out and safely don't want well, you can hit by a car or anything. But you can help them out, pick them up. If you pick up a wild turtle, it's probably not going to stay out like Tommy is. Like he's been with us for over 30 years. So he's very used to being handled. A wild one is going to kind of close all up. You're not going to be able to see them at all. There's right. going to look like a big rock here. Pick them up, just put them whatever way they were facing. Because if you put them back over here, as soon as you drive away, they're just going to go, no, I want to go that they're way. That's gonna... where I need to go. Either find mm -hmm. food, get away from something, or because go Because they have eggs. instinct. Mm -hmm. They have instincts. And it's very it's hard smart. to get over that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So take them by the back, because they might snap. So um, not necessarily. Maybe. These guys are more so just going to tuck inside their shell. Um, if it's a big snapping turtle, yeah, you don't want to hold okay. one like this, big snapping turtle. These guys are pretty much going to cl um, close up. If they don't close up or if something is kind of going for you, kind of go on the back here a little bit. Main thing is you don't want to just grab on the top shell and lift up. Yeah. Because this shell is part of their skeleton. It's not something like a hermit crab which can climb in and out. We do have a the shell over here. A lot of people think that. that yeah. They don't think they're in their shell. Mm -hmm. They are their shell. They are their shell. Yeah. It's not a little home they move in and out of. It's mm -hmm. They carry it with them. On the inside, you actually see a little bit of their spine. It runs on the inner top here. On the top, you can see the bumps. On the inside here, you can see a little bit of that spine there. So if you pick it up, it you're kind of just pulling on some bone there. It's not really the most comfortable. It can hurt them. So get a little bit kind of on top and bottom there. And they're usually pretty good about letting you get them into a safe spot. If you're a little bit worried, you can always get some gloves or if you have some kind of box or something, just kind of shush them along a little bit. Yeah, I've done that myself a Absolutely. couple of times. Yeah. They, they, so you. I know that Tommy's not releasable, but say a little bit about what the releasing process is like when you do go back out. How do you decide where to release them? You know, how do you get them used to it? What, you know, what's the process like? Mm -hmm. Sure, so our wildlife hospital um, team, as, as soon as they are cleared, and depending on the species, um, we have over 140 different types of species in New Jersey that we treat in our wildlife hospital. And um, we see over 6,300 New Jersey native wildlife every single year. That's an um, astronomical, that number is, is flooring me. It's a it lot. It truly is. I think it was a lot of it's in the summertime is when wow. most of them come we in. Wow, we see a lot of babies in baby season. So um, if you're mowing your lawn and you find a nest of, um, of bunnies that, you know, unfortunately hit, get hit by a lawnmower, just double check to make sure, you know. Yeah. Um, that you don't have any bunny spots in your yard before that. Um, but um, definitely in the springtime, um, during baby season, after a storm, um, and all sorts of different things. But um, a lot of it is human interaction, right? So I either found a, a baby or an animal in need, and I kept it. Um, please don't keep it. But um, no food, water. Um, we always say no food or water. Keep it in a dark spot until you're able to bring um, or call a wildlife rehabilitator to give the best advice because if let's say there was a wing injury um, Just like for a person if you got hit by a car and you broke your leg it, You want medical attention right away right. You don't want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich just shoved in your face with from a giant, right? Um, so we say the same thing, you know, just please be careful um, and make sure to call a wildlife rehabilitator in your area. And that's why Cedar Run is so important um, as, a, as a community yeah. resource. I will say one Love important it. thing with box turtles, if we have to release them, box turtles don't have a wide range of their habitat. They pretty much only stay within, I've heard anything, some people say like one football field their entire life, some people say like one square mile or two square miles. Mm -hmm. It's really not that big. I mean, it's kind of big when you only grow this big, but comparatively, it's not a huge area. So. Um, people will sometimes like tr think they're going to help them out and like pick them up and move them down the road a little bit and they're going to feel lost. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of animals, especially like our box turtles, we have to release them. We try to get as close as possible to where they were from. So when you come in to drop off an injured or some kind of animal if it needs a little bit of help, mm -hmm. there's a little form you fill out that tells us where you found it, where it's from. So we can try to see whether that's a safe spot for them to go back to if we do get to the point where they are able to be released. 
as well as um, birds of prey too. So um, a lot of it is territorial. So a red-tailed hawk, if it did, if it was an adult and it did get injured um, by a car or an impact injury, um, we try to make sure that they're they're within that range of field um, where they're where their scope is. So. It makes us realize there's so much to know. Yes. And I'm sure even for you guys, you don't know everything. You're still know. learning. Mm -hmm. yes. You learn from the animals themselves. So we only have a, a minute or so, but but how can people get involved or support you sure. and your work through donations, so, volunteering, et cetera? Yeah, so Cedar Run is not government or federally funded. Um, so donations are huge for us to be able to continue the work that we do. Um, volunteer, if you have some time, we always um, you know, are looking for volunteers. They're the lifeblood. We are a small but mighty team. Um, and you, know, you can volunteer in our hospital. You can volunteer um, at our nature center events, um, support us at events, support us um, by a wish list. So we have an Amazon wish list of much needed items, um, pick up some paper towel rolls, um, some different things like that. Check out cedarrun.org um, on different ways to give and um, and we really appreciate all of you know what the public is able to do um, to help us continue our mission. Well, I personally will do anything for the animals and you know, so we're going to do a part two to this show and bring on some more wonderful friends. But Jim, any final words? Uh, just make sure you keep an eye out for the animals out there, yeah. um, whether they're, you know, furry, scaly, feathered, whatever they are. We got to share this big old world with them. Just make sure we're giving them their proper place and making sure we give them yeah. the ability to see from afar. I mean, I'm always a big fan of animals, but not always necessary to get close. 100%. All right, let's respect each other's space. Let's live in harmony. We are all earthlings. Thank you both so much Thank for being you so here. Much. Thanks for all that you've shared. Thanks for the work you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. Wrapping up another enlightening show. What can you do to show compassion for wild animals, companion animals, and farm animals? First, do no harm through your everyday actions. Second, help them when possible. And third, otherwise, leave them alone. Thank you for watching. Check out michellegramberg.com, go vegan, and join me next time on Positive Energy.